You can go to a party, you can go to Brazil, but you know the jihadis, they still wish you ill. You can go off to Spain, you can even go insane, but the jihadis will keep trying to kill folks. Again. That was a British again there at the end. Uh, I'm hoping for the Nobel Prize in Poetry, ladies and gentlemen, but we'll see what the Nobel Committee says about that. Welcome to This Week in Jihad. Once again here with the great, the one, the only, the master of disaster, Dr. David Wood. And it's, I am, it's called, of course, Robert Spencer. Yes, sir. It's called, it's called a near rhyme, Robert. I think it's called a near rhyme. A near rhyme. A near mm -hmm. rhyme. Once again, you have explained what we have. What we... <laughs> yes. Welcome once again, ladies and gentlemen. We are here. We are... No, I'm not going to go along with that. That's not not where we're going on this show. This is a family program. Anyway, we have a lot of jihad here, and we're going to get right to it. David is uh, going to take care of some things real quick, and then he'll be... Oh, oh, oh yeah. Yes, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm just... Uh, 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 someone's posting a video about Tristan Tate and Sneeko defending child marriage have, have you seen the recent massive defenses of child marriage Robert? oh yeah yeah, yeah i've seen a little bit of it but can you fill us all in oh yeah so you may you may recall if we just go back say 10 or 12 years robert do you remember a time when we're back there saying islam promotes child marriage uh what were what were uh what were the da'is saying in response to us back then you are liars you are bigots no. you are racists you are islamophobes yeah, so we're racist and bigots and Islamophobes because we're quoting the Muslim sources and saying, hey, child marriage is, is uh, th that is promoted in, in Islam and Muhammad is the pattern of conduct and he married a little girl. And so we've got this issue and, and we were called liars, bigots, racists, everything for simply quoting their sources to them. Uh, so we were called liars. And then of course we keep just sharing their sources. How are we lying? How are we lying? How are we lying? Lo and behold, 10 or 12 years goes by. And now they're all defending child marriage. Ali Dawa, Muhammad Hijab, um, even, even brand new converts. I mean, Sneeko just converted to Islam and he's already defending child marriage. And he said uh, that, you know, he used to condemn it, but now he's realized that parents uh, can make good decisions about marrying off their prepubescent girls. Uh, Tristan Tate, that's brother of Andrew Tate. He's the less popular, uh, you know, version of Andrew <laughs> Tate. But uh, I, I, I'm not even sure whether he's a Muslim. He's referring to Muhammad as Prophet Muhammad now. So I don't I don't know. Um, but he a, a that's few months a ago. Off. Yeah. And uh, and with the with the peace be upon him after after his oh, name. Oh well, I mean the the newspapers all call him Prophet Muhammad, but they don't do the baba. Yeah, and uh, so Tristan, but Tristan Tate is now defending it. And and what's interesting, he's using all the standard Dawa responses. He's going, oh look, I Isabella was married to uh, King Henry the Second when she was six, and so on. It's funny he he in his defense of child marriage, he brought that up. And then linked to a Wikipedia article. I, I posted the Wikip what the Wikipedia article actually says. It says since she was she was too young, the marriage was never consummated. They never consummated the marriage, and he the guy treated her like a daughter because it was a political uh, it was a political arrangement, and so on and so. But anyway, the point is that's exactly the the dawa responses right you say mm -hmm. hey muhammad had sex with a little girl oh but look at this king as if that's as if that's relevant or as if that king is our is our pattern of conduct or something like that um and and then it was of course ah oh, but mary was a child too oh, yes. if if you just look it up you'll see and uh and it's like he's giving the standard dawa response anyway the point is these guys are brand new to islam and it's like it used they used Da'is used to wait. They used to wait a while. They used to, you know, get someone get someone thoroughly uh, buried in Islam before you tell them about the child marriage. Now they're leading off with this. It's like, hey guys, what am I supposed to do as a new Muslim? Uh, pray five times a day and marry a kid. And it's uh, it's weird that <laughs> anyway, anyway. The, the reason this is good to to bring up at the at the beginning of an episode of this week in jihad is that 
Robert, do you, do you think there might be some parallel here with jihad, where for years we've been saying this is what the Muslim sources say about jihad, and we're called liars and bigots and racists and Islamophobes, and then suddenly once everything reaches some sort of critical mass, they all, oh yeah, of course, that's what we teach. Ha ha ha. And that is That's think? coming. That's coming. I mean, after all, this phenomenon of them denying it all and claiming that the Islamic sources don't really teach these things, this is a modern thing. You go back, you look in the history of jihad, you see the, the, the rightly guided caliphs, the Umayyads, the Abbasids, the Ottomans, they all waged jihad. Many others did as well. The Mughals in India and oh, so on and on and on and on. And they never said, oh, by the way, those who wage jihad in a violent manner are misunderstanding Islam and misinterpreting the texts. They never said that I Islam forbade J offensive jihad warfare they were proud of it they uh were open about it and so i think that uh what we have in all this denial is an indication of the small size of the islamic community in the united states and in the west in general 20 some years ago or 30 years ago even and the community was so small that they fall back on the uh, Meccan period of teaching peace and tolerance, when really what they meant was you should have peace and tolerance for us. And once they achieve critical mass, then they start to preach more openly about warfare and violence. And so uh, I think that's very much on the horizon and that all this about child marriage and the shift in the attitudes regarding child marriage it's an indication that that is coming. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, got a lot of jihad here, sir. A lot of stories. Lot. Of, yeah, I know you, you'd you think that. They uh, would... it, well, I would think based on the fact that I haven't heard about any of this. Yeah. Yeah. I check. I check the news every day. I, I've, I've, I haven't seen any jihad. So I don't know what you're talking about, Robert. Well, uh, David, did you hear about the story out of Uganda? Nope about a woman named, uh, here it is, Sharifa Muhando. Sharifa Muhando of Kasezi Town in Uganda. And she was married to a gentleman named Musa Buambale. Musa Buambale. And Musa Buambale, uh, he uh, found out that she had become a Christian. Sharifa Muhando. And so what do you think he did, David? Well, there, there are a range of things we, I mean, even according to Islamic law, um, you can get some, it's the, the, the four schools of Sunni Islamic jurisprudence all say that an apostate should be killed. They have, a, they have some slight differences when it comes to female uh, apostates. Um, some would say that you uh, kill her like you kill a man. Some would say, no, you uh, lash her or lock her in a room or something like that until she uh, wants to come out. But uh, anyway, um, I mean, and, and then you have all these modifications where they don't actually carry out the correct penalty according to Sharia because they can't. So sometimes they'll, you know, douse people in acid or rape them or do all kinds of things. But I don't know. I'll go. I'll go with killed. I'll go with killed her as a guess. Well, he didn't actually kill her directly. I think what he had in mind may have been the a statement in the Quran about uh, confining women until death, but he had a novel way to do that as well. Old Musa Bwambale. He, uh, in the first place, he, he, he found out when he came home and she had fallen asleep while reading the Bible. And so the Bible was there next to her while she's lying there asleep. And so he cried out something. He exclaimed something, David. <laughs> I know. I know. It's you, it, there's just no drama in this at this point. Every you want, everyone in the world knows what he said. You want me to say it's <laughs> Allahu Akbar, don't you? You're correct, sir. He said Allahu Akbar, he started to beat her. Now, where would he get the idea that he should beat her? Uh I don't know. The Quran? And, Why yes, or the, David, or, or the you hadith, have... or the hadith. Either one. You can go to the Quran or the hadith, and you get wife beating. Yes, you were correct, sir. Once again, 
And so they uh, he beat her, but then he took her on a trip to the nearby Queen Elizabeth National Park, which is in Uganda. The Queen Elizabeth National Park. There it is. Looks like a happy place. And it's a wildlife park. You go there and you can look at the rhinos and, you know, uh, Mitt Romney and all the rest of them. And the elephants, etc., etc., etc. And so he left her there, hoping that the wild animals would eat her for dinner. And uh, she was, however, rescued. He said he had a dream where Allah told him to drive her to the Queen Elizabeth National Park where she would be eaten by wild animals. Allah told him that he would be rewarded with paradise for doing this. Well, I mean, you got to go with you got to go with your dreams on that. I mean, after all, Muhammad said that he saw in a dream that he had to marry Aisha. Oh, did you see how I tied it back into what we let off with? That's beautiful. Beautiful. And and also uh Zainab, he got a revelation that Allah had married him to Zainab. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I should said, oh, it, uh, I mean, go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah, you, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, I just, it's amazing that they're getting all these dreams telling them to do all the perverted and sick and evil stuff that they want to do. Shock. Everything they want to do. Even I just said it when uh, he, he says, he comes out of his revelation trance and, uh, uh, he says, who will go tell Zainab the good news that Allah has married her to me? And Aisha says, truly Allah hastens to grant you your desires. And I thought, yeah, you, you got it, sister. He does. Uh, here's an interesting comment, David, from the stream. Robert Spencer says, Prophet Muhammad never existed, but he would not stop talking about him. Ha 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 ha, clown. Well, <laughs> <laughs> David, can you explain this apparent contradiction? Uh, yeah, so um, I guess the idea would be that even though you suspect that Muhammad didn't actually exist and was a later fabrication, there are nevertheless, uh, you know, 1.8 billion or so people who believe in him and a portion of those uh, believe that you need to go out and, and chop people's heads off uh, over him and marry little kids over him. And so it kind of wouldn't matter whether he's... Uh, a, a real figure, as I believe, or a fictional character, as you believe, the the impact that he has is real. And, Indeed, and we are we are united in opposing his his impact. And so, I mean, I well mean, think said, of, sir. I, I mean, think about this: is 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 the claim is the claim here? Um, hey, you know, people are being slaughtered. Christians are being slaughtered. Hindus are being slaughtered. Everyone's being slaughtered in the name of Allah. Apostates are being uh, killed. Uh, women are being raped. But you believe it's all based on a fictional character, so shut up about it. Like, isn't that that would be insane, right? I mean, it, it. it it kind of makes it it kind of makes it worse and and more worthy of being responded to if all of this is over a fictional character. I mean, yes. I believe I believe he's a false prophet, and therefore uh, I would oppose him. But I mean, if it's if it's a fictional false prophet that they're all killing and slaughtering over and marrying little kids over, it's like, okay, this is, this is really, really bad. Wait till you see, I got, I got to, I got to go here at this point. Wait till you see David and wait till the world sees the uh, book I'm writing right now, Muhammad, a critical biography. I don't even have to turn it in till December 1st. It'll be out sometime next year. So it's going to be a long wait. I'm way jumping the gun here, but, uh, Still, I got to say, I was very excited about how it's coming along because the other day I was working on uh, some early traditions, the birth and some of the things before the uh, prophecy, actually at the time of the uh, coming of Gabriel too. But just a brief, a brief explanation. Uh, I quote the traditions that say, this is a critical biography. Muhammad, a critical biography is the name of the book. And so I'm going through the traditions, not just to show what the biographical material about Muhammad says, but also what variant traditions say. And so uh, say that Muhammad was born on the 10th day or the 12th day of the month of Rabi al Awal. And then other traditions say, well, no, it was the second day of Rabi al Awal or the 10th day 
of Rabi Alawal. And Muhammad was called Muhammad because his his mother, Amina, had a dream while, heard a voice rather, while she was pregnant and the, it said, call him Muhammad. But he was actually named Kutham, according to a different tradition, because his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, had a son, Kutham, that he was very fond of, who died young. And so he named the boy Kutham, but then he was renamed Muhammad later. Some people say only when he became a prophet, and others say when he, when Amina told Abdul Muttalib about the dream, or the voice. And he became a prophet on the 17th of Ramadan, when Gabriel appeared to him, except some traditions say it was Saraphel who appeared to him for three years, and then Gabriel replaced Saraphel, and the the angel that appeared to him said, recite in the name of your Lord who created man from clots of blood, uh, although s other traditions say that the angel said to him, oh, you who are enveloped in your cloak, arise. Uh, that's the beginning of Surah 74 versus the beginning of Surah 96. And Every last detail, in other words, of the story that Muslims accept in regard to uh, Muhammad is controverted by other early Islamic traditions that are just as strong as the primary ones. And you know, we don't hear about that. The Islamic tradition gives it all to us neatly packaged and all making sense. So uh, I think this book is going to be a lot of fun, really, for, for, for many people to see. Uh uh, you, you were mentioning the the dream, you know, and and it's interesting because you know if I if I had a if I had a dream saying no, you should name your son this or something like that, uh, I don't know if it's a cool name. I might I, I could go with the dream. If it's, uh, I have a dream about marrying a, a six year old. <laughs> I, I'm probably going to go see a psychiatrist or something, right? I mean, one would think, one would, would hope. Or, yeah, or, 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 hey, you need to, you know, hand this person over to animals to kill and so on. These, uh, these are the kinds of things where I'd say, nah, I can't exactly trust a, a dream on this stuff. Um, but I don't know. In Islam, it's, oh, any perverted, sick, evil, violent thing you, <laughs> you dream of. Uh, yeah. Anyway, it's interesting that has such a long tradition. Oh, by the way, it was, I mentioned the 17th of Ramadan, but also other traditions say it was the 18th of Ramadan or the 24th of Ramadan. And see, these things are supposed to be precise histories that are supposed to impress us with their detail that all these things were remembered so precisely that we have the exact dates, and yet other traditions give different exact dates. So none of it works. Okay, out of Nigeria, David. Terrible story out of Nigeria. Uh, and you can perhaps remind us why Nigeria is such a flashpoint. But the Reverend Daniel Danbeki of the Evangelical Church winning all in Talakafia Village, Karu County, and his wife were sleeping in their homes in their village on the night of May 11th. The Fulani Jihadi showed up, murdered the pastor and his wife, murdered 41 other people in central Nigeria and burned down the church burned down many of the homes in which the Christians lived. Many of those who were trying to escape were also shot as they tried to flee. Why would they be so thoroughgoingly cruel about this and even try to kill the people trying to escape? Well, when, when, whenever you have a, a system like <clears throat> Islam, uh, there's there's obviously something that works about its methodology uh and it, it could be something completely evil as it is in this case but there's a the, in general if, if an ideology lasts a lot a long time it's got something going for for it what for why it works um and in islam they just have this methodology where uh going back to the time of muhammad if you're if you're in the minority you know preach peace and tolerance once you're more powerful then you can form uh you know defensive alliances and wage defensive jihad and then once you're the most powerful then you uh you wage offensive jihad subjugating everyone around you and uh the, the idea is to just keep expanding and wherever wherever someone stops you all right no problem dig in dig in and 
if it takes a century, two centuries, three centuries, whatever, keep pushing that line uh, further back so that Islam keeps expanding. And you have these areas of the world. Uh, India is one of them. Uh, Nigeria, you have these places where it's basically Muslims, uh, Muslim majority on one side of the line and non-Muslim majority on the other side of the line. And they want to keep pushing on that and they want to keep pushing that. And it, they, they don't seem to care if it, they're long term thinking in, in, in the sense of we don't care if this takes six months. We don't care if this takes uh, six centuries. We are going to we're going to take over and dominate this this area completely. And it's it's sad because, I mean, look at Western journalists. They just they ignore all this stuff that's going on. And if something doesn't happen, you're going to, you know, the next generation is going to see Christianity wiped out and completely subjugated in 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 places like Nigeria. And uh, and and somehow, somehow we're the bad ones for for mentioning it. Yes, you would almost think that they're all in the same league, all in the same group. In another place in Nigeria, Sokoto State, in northwest Nigeria, in the Tangaza local government area of the state, the jihadis showed up. David, they opened fire on villages, killed 37 people. So the jihad is considerably emboldened in Nigeria. In, in uh, Cameroon, right next door, the Islamic State jihad group claimed responsibility for an attack on a security post killing two customs officers, a policeman, and a civilian. Shall we go to Europe? Oh, no, I have more from Africa. Somalia, over in East Africa. And, and, and by the way, it's, it's, it's important that you uh, share the news about jihad in Africa because no one else does. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And they have no idea what's going on. You know, you have jihad all over Nigeria, as we've been discussing, as well as in Mali, on the one side of Nigeria, in the, on the western side, and Cameroon on the eastern side, the southeastern side, and the northwestern side. You have uh, jihad in that whole area. And then edging into Central Africa, into the northern northeastern part of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And then you have it in Uganda, uh, where I believe there was, yeah, we had a story on Uganda already today. And then you have it in Somalia, which is a little bit farther east from Uganda. So all across Africa, the, the in, in Central Africa, west to east, you could have conceivably, within the next 10, 20 years, a caliphate that extends all the way across the continent and then extends to the south, where in Mozambique, they already control territory there as well. In Somalia, we have the jihadis killing 54 peacekeeping troops from the African Union, which only underscores the fact that is clear every week that we do this, David, that the governments of these countries involved cannot or will not stand up to these jihadis. And that means that they are not long for this world, really, because the jihadis have political power in mind. And even the even the Muslim, uh, the Muslim organizations that constantly uh, complain about people like you, they don't they don't they don't take their stand against these guys either, right? It, it's I mean, think if if you actually believed that Islam is peaceful and tolerant and shouldn't be killing people. Shouldn't the first people you're trying to tell that to be the jihadis? I mean, that would be if, if I had if you know, we, there have been groups like Westboro Baptist Church and stuff like this. Christians generally regard them as as nuts. But imagine you had a movement like that and it started taking off and then they got violent and then they wanted to go around killing and slaughtering people. Um, my if, if, if that were to happen, if Christians started going on like killing sprees and then growing and expanding, uh, my main concern would be those Christians who are doing it and, mm -hmm. and, and, and exposing them and showing them that they're wrong. Uh, my, my main effort would not be silence everyone about it and just, yeah. just let it, just let it keep going and let it keep expanding and let them keep murdering people. Just make sure that no one mentions it. But that's what, that's what these uh, Western, you know, care and so on. That's what they do. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going on. Yeah, we're not going to oppose. We're not going to oppose the ones who are doing it. We're not going to oppose the slaughtering. We're not going to do anything about it. We're not even going to criticize them. We're just going to silence everyone who complains about it. 
And the result is you, you eventually end up with a population that is so terrified of criticizing anything to do with Islam that they will literally let thousands and thousands of little girls be gang raped for fear mm -hmm. of being called Islamophobic. And, yep. it's, uh, and, and, and there aren't a lot of people who stand up against you know, groups like CARE in the face of this. Almost everyone just instantly backs down as soon as they say, oh, this person's an Islamophobe. And uh, it's weird because anyone with the spine to stand up for little girls and victims of jihad and so on is evil. And everyone who defends it is somehow good. And this, I mean, again, it feels like we're, we live in opposite world right now. Yes, we do. That's exactly where we live, David. Or should I say, divad. Anyway, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm not even sure you're here. Okay, this is Yunus Kathrata. Yunus Kathrata out of Canada. You remember him, David? He is a very prominent imam at the Muslim Youth Victoria Islamic Center, which I believe is out west in British Columbia. Uh, and Yunus Kathrada is often in the news because he does not conceal the reality of Islam. And this is what he said during a sermon, a Friday sermon last week. He said, yes, Islam, that is Allah, who legislated Islam for us, has ordered us and commanded us to hate, to reject, and to detest the disbelievers. And then he explains. And here, let me just pause for a second. If I hate broccoli, does it mean that I'm going to smash it all up and not allow anybody to eat it? When I say I hate something or someone, let's say I hate someone. It means I hate them because of something that they stand for, for example. But it does not in any way, shape, or form indicate violence. Hatred is not equivalent to violence. Hatred might lead to violence, but not necessarily. That that that's funny, by the way, right? It's like, ah, oh, we hate the we hate these kufar, we hate them, we hate them, we hate them. But I know I'm being recorded right now. <laughs> yeah, I know I'm gonna end up on memory. So let me go ahead and clarify that just because I hate you all. And I want you I want you all to burn in hell and I want to subjugate you and take your women as captives and everything else. It doesn't mean I'm violent. So I have not advocated violence, ladies and gentlemen, just hatred, which even I admit leads to violence, especially once uh, we reach a critical mass and then we can impose uh, Sharia on everybody. you got to love these guys. Man. It's like... Yes, indeed. So he goes on to say for the qualities of the disbelievers is that they live a life of animals. Where did he get that idea? Where did where does anyone liken non-muslims to animals david uh the quran and the, the hadith quran. wow really wow uh they live like beasts not like human beings this allah clarified for us and this is why we see them exaggerating going to extremes and fulfilling their desires and their lusts nightclubs drugs you name it of course we know that muslims never go to nightclubs or take drugs the disbelievers enjoy their lives, enjoy in quotation marks, to the fullest, while they are heedless of what is going on, going to happen to them in the hereafter. Just like the cattle that graze in the pastures are unaware of the fact that they will probably end up in the slaughterhouse. These guys, uh, these guys saying stuff that they know is going to come across as uh, possibly pushing up against some laws or rules and so on. And then so them adding adding some some qualifications and caveats to point out that they're not actually advocating breaking the law. Uh, I've seen this over and over and over again, like like Daniel Hakikachu. He does his recent He's debate okay. with he does his uh, recent debate with inspiring philosophy and uh, defend spends the entire time defending child marriage and promoting child marriage. But then he'll say, oh, I'm not advocating breaking any laws here. Uh, so re re respect your local laws, just to clarify that he's not advocating uh, actually doing it, even though these guys like have advocate secret second wives, which are not legal in the eyes of the state. So they're, they're breaking the law. They're breaking the law. So they're, they're fine with that. Uh, but then you had a uh, you had Mohammed hijab and he's posting he would post a threat to rape and torture someone like uh, 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 the apostate prophet's wife. But he'll just add words that make it not uh, that make it metaphorical right so he'll he'll include all the all the threats of rape and torture but he'll add some words 
to make it like it sound metaphorically raping and torturing you. And it's just uh, anyway, it's interesting that they're they're aware of the laws. They're kind mm -hmm. of announcing what their plans are, but making sure that they haven't crossed a, a legal line. That's uh, yeah, I'm sure that they uh, think they're very clever in doing that. Anyway, uh, speaking of crossing lines, this is a 17th century painting of the baby Jesus that is in a church in Hamburg, Germany. And you'll notice that it has a big slash. And look where the slash is, David. It's right across the throat. The slash was done with a big knife or some sharp object in uh, Hamburg's church, main churches of St. Peter and St. James. The uh, painting of the Nativity by Gottfried Liebalt in 1649 is in St. Peter's church. And six other paintings there were damaged in that church. Other paintings in St. James Church. The damage looks like it's going to be between fifty to 80,000 euros. And people are confused. They don't know why this has happened. They don't understand. The, the police are investigating. They don't know who did it. They're trying to figure out what on earth the motive could be. Do you think there's any kind of guideline you might be able to give them as to what to look for? Uh, actually, this one, this one's uh, this one could go in multiple directions. So you have Islam's problem with images and so on, mm -hmm. um, and the then, throat. Yeah, you have yeah that as far as going going for the throat. You have Muhammad uh, when he when he took over Mecca, desecrating and and degrading the idols. Uh, and Muhammad said Muhammad went around stabbing them in the eyes. And so they might view themselves as doing that by, you know, slashing the throats on paintings and so on. What's interesting is you could argue this one either way, because according to Ibn Ishaq, when Muhammad went around smashing these idols and so on, uh, he had pictures removed from the Kaaba. Mm -hmm. But then he saw a picture of Jesus and Mary and said, no, don't 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 destroy this one. He liked the picture of Jesus and Mary and thought that he, he couldn't bring himself to, to desecrate that one. Uh, so. Anyway, so I, I think if I were a Christian, I actually, you know, knew about this stuff and I was over there talking to them. I would say, hey, guys, you shouldn't be attacking pictures of Jesus because uh, that was the exception your fake prophet made. Indeed. OK, also in Germany, we have uh, seven jihadis, including several with uh, citizenship elsewhere, Turkey, Morocco and Kosovo. And uh, they were arrested for being part of a financial network to finance the Islamic State, or ISIS. Uh, I thought ISIS had nothing to do with Islam, David. Yeah, that's what I keep hearing. It's very strange. I don't understand why anybody would want to finance that. One of life's great mysteries. It is indeed. Also in Germany, we have a 57-year-old Syrian who attacked residents and police officers in uh, in Henrik Ibsenstrasse in the Evershagen district of Rostock. Uh, Rostock. Anyway, he uh, attacked them with a knife, aggressively threatened the cops, did not comply with their orders, and ultimately was shot himself. A Syrian. You would think he would just be grateful to be in his new country and eager to start his new life. So I don't understand why he would attack people and uh, police officers with a knife. I don't understand that at all. No, it's just weird. Yeah. Interesting story out of uh, Paris, David, over in France. We have not, uh, not Paris, Texas, or uh, New York. Anyway. You mean the France, real, the, the real smelly place. Right, the, the Arc de Triomphe, Paris. The, uh, anyway. The city of no showers. The Eiffel Tower, Paris. The Eiffel Tower, no shower. Yikes. I thought the poetry was my job. <laughs> anyway, uh, we have here that it came to light that a mosque in Paris was telling people in the mosque that, they, uh, that theft from unbelievers was perfectly okay as long as they gave the mosque 20%. 
Where did they get that idea, David? That sounds exactly like Muhammad. Uh, go out and go out and rob all these unbelievers, and then give me a, a fifth of the the hummus. It's the war booty. Indeed, indeed, it's right there in chapter eight, verse forty-one of the Quran that you give the prophet twenty percent. Of course, if the prophet's not around, you can drop it off at the local mosque, and they will make sure it goes to good use. And, and by the way, it's uh, I mean they probably realize like you you. You'd read you'd read something like that and think, oh, these guys just want people to go out and steal and then give you know twenty percent, and that's a source of revenue. But I mean, Muhammad understood this was this was part of the message. This was part of the reason for converting. Like, hey, why do you why do you want to convert to this? Well, if you join me and fight for me, you get to go around taking everyone's stuff, and God is cool with it. I'm going, really, I get to go around taking people's wives and daughters and enslaving enslaving everyone and taking all their stuff and so i don't wait i don't have to work all my life and building a house i could just go and, and kill that guy and take his house and take his wife and you know murder him and 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 this is all good with god oh sign me up right now uh i mean and you see this this goes on till the till the present time when you know the taliban eventually just wins and then they're all confused saying we don't know what to do now we don't know what to do. We don't know anything about actually working and running a country. All we know about is fighting and taking stuff. And so they're they're confused. And that that's probably part of the reason why they're like flirting with the idea of fighting Iran. They don't know how to they don't know how to do anything else. And so on. It, so if you if you get in the habit of like we we're the ones who go around taking everyone else's stuff and all we have to do is conquer them and make them give us stuff, then it it comes hard if it becomes it becomes difficult once you have, you've actually like conquered everyone around you. And then what do you do then you you've, mm -hmm. you've got everything. And now you have to actually work and do something and gosh, darn it. That's hard. <laughs> yes. This is our friend, Matthew King. We talked about him a bit last week. If I recall correctly, he is a convert to Islam in Britain. And you can see him there making the, uh, one finger sign of ISIS that is a gesture of allegiance to Tawheed, to the unity of Allah. So, so some people would have a different finger in response. That is correct, sir. In any case, a little bit more has come out about Matthew King. This is the kid. He, he, he's uh, 19 years old now, and his mom actually turned him in because Aww. she saw that he was planning to torture and kill uh an American or British soldier, and had also talked about d carrying out a mass casualty attack. And so his mom saw this stuff, and she went to the cops. Come on, mom. <laughs> exactly. Anyway, uh, he bought also he bought weapons. He bought tactical gloves and goggles, and he put on as, as his WhatsApp status. He put, kill non-Muslims wherever you see them. Where did well, he, he get made, that? He must he, have made it up, Robert. Yeah, that's he, he must have twisted and hijacked Islam. Uh, actually, kill non-Muslims wherever you see them is a fairly faithful rendition of kill them wherever you find them, which is twice in the Quran, 2, 191 and 489. And then 9, 5 is... Kill the mushrikeen wherever you find them. That is, those who associate partners with Allah. Anyway, uh, since he's been in prison, he did call mom. And he told her, I'm not extreme anymore. That's what he said. I'm just, not I'm just passing it on here. Not extreme anymore, mom. Come on. <laughs> That's right. But I think he's going to be in prison for... Good long while he's been jailed for life, which in Britain might mean up to two or three years. Yeah, uh, I mean, now if you had if you were there and you criticized him, they they'd lock you up and throw away the key. Well, I'm dangerous for Britain. They don't even let me in. But Matthew yeah, you can't even King, go. In. Yeah, he's, he's good to in. go. Yeah, he's fine. But by, by the way, I think this is going to be an increasing problem, even with with young people. Uh, Chris Rock in his recent comedy special was pointing out how people are becoming addicted to attention. Like we're creating a culture where everyone is addicted mm -hmm. to attention. And then he goes through the different ways that people can get attention. And like one of the ways is to just be the absolute best at something. 
problem is that's the one that takes the most work being, you know, be, being the becoming the best at what you do or becoming at least really, really awesome so that you get attention for being great at what you do. That requires tons and tons of work. So he points out that there are other ways to get attention, which are far easier. So he says, you know, if you're hot, you can just show your, your, your hot woman. You can just show yourself naked and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So you can, uh, you know, you can become a Kardashian or something like that. If you're hot enough, you don't have, you don't have to have any, you know, actual abilities and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but but one of the ways is, I mean, he points out like things like school shooting. These are people who school shootings. These are people who are like cr craving attention and are willing to do anything to do it. Now, if I have to go and massacre a bunch of people, as long as it gets me a lot of attention, uh, that's fine. And so anyway, the point is you're combining a, a cultural obsession with getting attention at any cost to sort of leave your mark on the world with an ideology that actually promotes the same thing, promotes you, you know, slaughtering people in the name of all in order to get attention for for yourself and your religion. And uh, anyway, point is, I think you're going to be seeing uh, an increasing number of young, young jihadis deciding when they're 14 and 15 to go slaughter people in the name of Allah. Because notice, notice this, this young guy, even though he's going to jail, they got some attention. People yeah. are gonna know who people are gonna know who he is. And that's, uh, that's much easier than spending your entire life working hard. And, accomplishing and even things. though he, uh, even though he has a life sentence, he'll be out before too long. Yep. And then he will uh, be a hero among the Muslim communities. Uh, I'm not, this is not crazy talk. You remember John Walker Lind, who was arrested fighting against American troops, fighting alongside the Taliban and Al Qaeda against American troops, kid from California in Afghanistan in 2003. And he served time in prison. And now he's out. He's done his time. And he published some articles. It's been a year or so since I've heard anything about him. But right when he got out, a lot, some Islamic groups were featuring him. And he was in some far left publications. And it was clear that this is a guy who's been in prison for the war on terror. There are a lot of groups that want to make heroes out of such people. And so he's got a bright future ahead being a uh, personality, a famous figure among the... Uh, pro-jihad groups and there are a lot of pro-jihad people out there i'm also reminded and, of uh of sorry oh i was just going to point out because we've talked about this a lot of times before with the uh the people who went over and joined isis that there are people who joined isis and did a bunch of stuff and then when they get caught it's understood hey we know what you did and so you're getting life in prison there are other people who went and joined isis and the governments don't know what they did. They, do, they don't have evidence on what these people did. And so they give them sentences of like five years or seven years or something like that for supporting a foreign terrorist organization. But they don't know, they don't know what they did in order to charge them with crimes beyond that. And so these people get, get sentences of five, seven, 10 years. Guess what? Those people are coming out. And so you have actual people who were over there fighting for ISIS who are, who are now going to be walking among us. They, are, they, all, they already mm -hmm. are. And so it's, uh, I don't know, it's, uh, <laughs> you, you better hope that that prison de-radicalization program, which everyone makes fun of because of how silly and stupid it is, uh, really just clicked with these guys for some reason. Wow. Otherwise, otherwise, you've got seasoned jihadis walking mm -hmm. amongst us in France and the UK and the United States and Canada waiting for their next orders to come in. Indeed. And, you know, another aspect of this attention-seeking business is that you'll get YouTubers. And, you know, you, you know all about the, uh, the Dawa guys. Did you hear about Malik Sanchez, Smooth Sanchez? Nope. This is a couple years ago. This is this kid in New York City. And I don't actually know anything about his background, but I figure from his name being Malik, he's probably half Arab because he... What happened was he would go around, and I actually watched one of these. It was it was really really torture. I don't watch videos as a rule, but um, this one was a bad one to pick if I was going to watch a video. But I wanted to find where he did it. He he would film videos of himself walking around New York City and being a jerk, basically yelling at people and insulting them and. He uh, walked into a store. He actually slapped a guy that was working in the store. And he's got it all filmed. And he's had these long videos, two, three hours, of him walking around being, being obnoxious in New York City. And in one of them, 
he went to a restaurant and everybody was sitting outside because this was high COVID time. And he says, I've got a bomb, Allahu Akbar. I'm going to blow you all up. And everybody, of course, panics and runs. And so he was actually sentenced to some time in prison for that. I believe it was all suspended. Uh, but his career as a YouTuber was over, and uh, at least for now. Uh, and that was the end of it. But I thought that is exactly the kind of person that this crazy culture that we have today produces. That you have somebody who's a seeking attention, like you were talking about, and so he thinks, what what better? And he's and he's seeking attention by being a obnoxious, terrible person. And so it was pro perhaps inevitable when he started that at some point he was going to claim to have a bomb and go jihad. And uh, that's what did him in, though. At least at this point, might need to uh, might need to talk more about this obsession with attention because it seems like it's the root of a lot of problems or, or more more like it's a it's a problem amplifier so jihad mm -hmm. is a problem wanting to slaughter unbelievers in the name of allah is a problem but it's 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 more of a problem if it becomes a, a cool way to get more attention for yourself in a culture that's obsessed with attention but like all sorts of things like that like the 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 dirtbag stuff people are doing on on social media a lot of that's for mm -hmm. attention even um you know, if you tell a if you tell a, a seven or eight year old, hey, do you want a lot of attention? You can get a lot of attention by transitioning to a different gender, but mm. not not just them, the parents as well, right? It's like a, a it could be a badge of honor. You've seen these messages where where a parents like, hey, my my child says she no longer wants to transition, so I've been crushing up the pills and putting them in her cereal and stuff. It's like, wait. I thought this was all based on your child's on your child's choice, and now your child doesn't want to do it anymore, and now you're forcing this stuff because you know you don't want to lose your 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 street cred and your <laughs> in your community. So terrible. But it's yeah, it's creepy creepy stuff going on. Indeed, indeed. Uh, let's see, David. This is Bart. Let me get him here. This is Bart Drenth. That is a name, a Dutch name, Bart Drenth probably saying it wrong, but it's D-R-E-N-T-H. Like, Drenth. Yes, I went out into the rain and I got Drenth. Anyway, Bart Drenth was up until recently the global managing director at a couple of art fairs in the Netherlands and in New York uh, called TEFAF. I don't know what TEFAF means or stands for, but in any case, he has been fired. And why was he fired? I'm glad you asked, David. He said, uh, just as with the Iranian Revolution in 1978, he means 79, left-wing do-gooders stand hand-in-hand -hand with jihadists, not knowing that after the success of the revolution, they will die first. And he also said that what must happen is we must normalize criticism of the Quran and the Prophet. And in response, he this guy sounds like a job. genius. <laughs> I mean, everything that dude just said is 100% common sense, right? I mean, yeah. it, this is not like, oh, what a brilliant guy, what a brilliant scholar. And so this is a guy who's not insane and deluded and idiotic. Now, I don't know what else he believes. So I don't know. He, he may, be, he may be, be completely crazy in other ways. I don't know. But everything he just said, hey, there's this weird alliance between the far left and Islam, which which should be polar opposites on on some of the issues that are most important to them. Um, and, you know, like LGBTQ and so on, they'd be the first ones exterminated by jihadis taking over an area. And so the, the fact that they have an alliance is really, really creepy. I know they both want to sexualize kids, but, um, you know, they, they want to they want to sexualize children in, in very different ways. Let's put it that way. Uh, and that's why they that's why they ultimately can't get along. And then the other part, hey, we, we need to we need to normalize criticism. I mean, how is that even controversial? And what's what's amazing is you could you could line people up and you could say, hey, is it a, is is beating women into submission a good idea? No. Is uh, chopping the heads off people for changing their beliefs a good idea? No. OK, well, th th those are things that have to do with Islam. Liar. Uh, okay, we, we can show you from the sources and we can show you an endless array 
of YouTubers and everyone else and scholars all advocating this stuff. Uh, can we criticize it then? Uh, no. Look, I, I will quote you right here. Muhammad said, if anyone leaves his Islamic religion, kill him. Is that bad? No, because Muhammad said it. Okay, if it, if it was anyone other than Muhammad, is it bad? Yes, of course. It's, it's I don't know. <laughs> He's, he, I, I, it seems like his point is you've kind of normalized not criticizing it, right? You've, you've, normalized, you've normalized justifying everything it teaches no matter what. And saying you got to reverse that process seems kind of commonsensical to me. We should also note that if he had said, we have to normalize criticism of Christianity, he'd be getting an award somewhere tonight. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, he wouldn't even say that because criticism of Christianity is normalized. And pretty normal for a, for a long while. Indeed. Matter of fact, matter of fact, I mean, he, he, he could rephrase it and put it like that and say, hey, I just, you know, Islam is so cool. I want it to join the club where we can criticize pretty much everything. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to leave. You don't want to be on the outside of all this, right? But of course they do. Indeed, in an exalted position. I want to thoroughly bring Islam into the West. He should say that. I really want to bring Islam and the Quran into the West. And they'll they'll say, yay. And then he could go, oh, yeah. And I mean, you know, it, it's open for criticism now. Nope. Story out of Egypt, David. Out of Egypt, we have Muhammad M. His last name was not revealed. Muhammad M., who is a policeman in the city of Tanta in the Nile Delta. And he got married, Muhammad did. And three days after the wedding, he uh, killed his wife because he said she refused to have sex with him. Now, where did he get the idea that this was something that was worth killing her about? Um, it, it, it's another situation where I can think of like a bunch of different justifications over it. So I, I think, you know, technically should have beat her or something like that. <clears throat> um, but you, you have in the Hadiths, Muhammad's saying that a woman does not have a right to refuse her husband, says wh exactly. whatever she's doing, if she's, you know, if she's cooking, whatever she's doing, she, as, as soon as the man wants sex, the woman has to drop whatever she's doing and satisfy her man. If she doesn't, for some reason, the husband's upset, then the angels are going to call down curses on her um, for not satisfying her husband. So you have things like that. And that would be one of the justifications for beating your wife into submission. Uh, but even, even this is a situation where, you know, you think, oh, well, how can you justify killing her? Well, if you think, wait a minute, Muhammad commands this, Muhammad has commanded me, I mean, has commanded you to do whatever I say, and, and you're refusing to do it. Surah 4 verse 65 says you're not a Muslim unless you submit to all of Muhammad's decisions. So a husband could get to the point where he thinks, ah, you are so rebellious to me, you're actually an apostate. Mm -hmm. You're an apostate and you have to die over this stuff. It's, 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 similar in, it's similar in like with honor killings and so on that you can, actually, you can actually say this person is not following the teachings of Muhammad and therefore is an apostate and we kill apostates. Indeed. Story, another story out in the Netherlands actually that... Uh... I meant to get to before and over, forgot about, but it's a terrific story, David. This is just the greatest idea ever. In the city of Dronten in the Netherlands, it turned out that a lot of the migrants who are overwhelmingly from Muslim countries were stealing bicycles. And so the uh, this local group here in Dronten, the... Uh, Central Agency for the Reception of Asylum Seekers is now offering migrants bicycles for $20 or 20 euros. And uh, this presumably will reduce theft. And of course, the uh, politician here, Wilders, the great critic of Islam in the Netherlands, he asked, will they also give millions to bank robbers to prevent bank robberies? And, well, you got a good point there. In any case, so uh, you need a cheap bike. You can just go to the Netherlands and not steal one. Or announce your intention to steal one. 
but I, you might have to say the Shahada first. Um, as someone who used to steal bikes, uh, <laughs> I'll sell you one for 20 bucks. I, I, I can vouch that this is not, not going to work because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's going to work either. I stole my first bike when I was seven. That was my first bike. That was the first bike we stole. But uh, yeah, I mean, if someone had, if someone had given me one, that wouldn't have. I don't think that would have solved the problem back then. Indeed. Uh, interesting story out of Saudi Arabia. But, but, yeah. Side no side note, especially especially a twenty dollar bike, <laughs> right? Like that's a crap. I have to say that's a crap bike. Like yeah. I stole, I stole one. I remember the one I stole. It had mag wheels on it, stuff like those. Those are not, those are not cheap. That's why we took it. Probably the guy whose bike it was is watching tonight and thinking, "Now I know that David Woods got my bike." If something weird ever, I, I'll even tell you, it was in Chicopee, Massachusetts. It was outside this store, and we went and stole it. And they called the cops on us, and we had already hidden the bike, so they didn't know who took it, and so on. Uh, if that dude is ever watching this, please contact me. I will get you a brand new, uh, very very nice bike to make up for that because you were a kid. I took Mag bike. wheels. Mag wheels. Oh no no! I'll, I'll, I'll get an awesome like diamond back or what? I don't know whatever cool bikes there are but yeah okay, okay. you heard it here bike victim contact interest david yeah you're talking 40 years of interest so i'll get you an awesome bike but you're gonna have to establish you are really the guy so oh yeah that's a problem too that's gonna have to be done though uh out of afghanistan david 80 primary school girls poisoned in mm -hmm. two separate attacks what is that all about yeah i i, I heard that um and we, we've seen, and you, it's an issue. You can't even say, oh, this is Sunni or Shia because they're poisoning girls in Iran too. Mm -hmm. So Iran, Afghanistan, um, Afghanistan, you could correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they've outlawed girls going to school beyond sixth grade. Mm -hmm. But then there are still people who are upset even about, you know, the first graders and the second graders and the third graders going to school and learning anything. So they're, they're, poisoning them over that is that is that correct yeah that's basically it the idea right. is girls might want, you might want to uh, have them learn to read and write so they can do things like make shopping lists but that's it you don't want them to learn anything beyond that and so it's and the line is controverted as to where you cut it off but uh it's interesting to note how the violence in girls schools has spread to iran now out of uh, where start, it used to be confined to Afghanistan. Uh, also in Iran, interesting story that I actually got from you, so yeah, I know you know all about it. Uh, a senior Muslim cleric in Iran, uh, Mohammed Dulabi, has said that uh, 50,000 mosques have closed. 50,000 of Iran's 75,000 mosques. In other words, two thirds of the mosques in the country have closed because people aren't going and uh what's going on yeah people uh people have pointed out you know this is this is a cleric saying this point like why would he why would he make this up but we you know we'd like to see more evidence on the statistics but this this lines up very well with something i saw maybe three years ago where there was a, a poll done in uh iran that said only 40 percent of iranians now say they believe in islam um the possible it's possible that that's not correct because it, it was an online survey. And so you might have, there might be a, you know, there might be a higher percentage of uh, serious Muslim, sincere Muslims in like villages that, that don't have internet access or who, who aren't online or who are working and not responding to the poll and so on. So it could be skewed, but even just for an online poll, that is massive when over half of Iranians no longer identify as Muslim. But anyway, the point is that, that, that lines up pretty well with this result. That mm -hmm. you know, two thirds of the mosques are now closed. You just wonder, you just wonder how long they can hold on. Uh, how long the the religious leaders going around, you know, killing women for refusing to wear a hijab and so on. You wonder how long they can carry on when it seems like it's dying there. These are people who have lived under the uh, under very strictly applied Islamic law since 1979, and they're disgusted not just with the regime but with the basis of the regime, which is Islam. 
Mm -hmm. Indeed. Indeed. And so I believe that brings us to the end of another astonishing hour, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, wait a second. Wait a second. Yes, sir. Uh, New video premieres over on uh, Act 17 Polemics uh, right now, 9 o'clock. So I'm sharing the link right now, everyone. There's a link there. There's a link there in the chat. The video is premiering right now at 9 o'clock. So what are we getting, David? What is it? Oh, it's a video with... Uh, I just talk about Sneeko and uh, Tristan Tate and how they're now defending child marriage. Like as soon as they... As soon as they start having happy thoughts about Islam, suddenly child marriage becomes acceptable. And so it's it's basically what we were talking about earlier that, uh, you know, for years they tell us this has nothing to do with Islam and we're lying. And then we keep throwing the sources in their faces and then they acknowledge it and then they start defending it and then they start advocating it. And now it's like the first thing a new Muslim learned, the first thing. Well, it's, it's pray five times a day and child marriage is OK. And uh, so anyway, I'm talking about that because you don't want him to go back. We don't want to. We don't want to go backwards in the sense of them realizing this is a bad idea and then going back to lying and saying we Islam doesn't teach that and we're liars. You want you, you want it to be known. So, yeah, we're exposing we're exposing this like because because think, think about it. Sneeko, Tristan Tate. How how did they instantly, instantly start sharing the same things we hear from the Dawa guys? It's because the Dawa guys are feeding them their responses, right? They're, they're okay, Christian just said this. Atheist just said this. Here's how you respond to this. And uh, that's fine. That's fine. Because we want we want them being honest. And uh, these are going to be fun times, Robert. They're going to be Oh, they are, time. David. They are. These are the most fun of all times. I can't wait, by the way, for... Uh... George Orwell in the Boom Boom Room with Muhammad. Looking forward to that one. But anyway, uh, it's been another week. We can hope there'll be no more jihad next week. But if there is, actually, I think I'm on the road. But uh, anyway, we'll be back probably at a later date with more jihad. Till then, be safe. God bless.